Hello everybody, welcome to the latest International Affairs webinar from Chatham House. My name is Ben Horton and I'm the Communications Manager for the journal International Affairs and I'm delighted to be chairing today's event on how images frame China's role in African development which draws on an article in our May issue by Dr George Caravas. George is an independent scholar based in Melbourne, Australia whose research interests include global development, global political economy, visual politics and Africa-China relations. Um, it's great to welcome George today. Um, thank you for joining us, George, all the way from down under. <laughs> thank you very much for having me, Ben. Um, so before we start, uh, I just have to run through a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this event is on the record. We're not going to be using the Chatham House rule today. Um, we'll be recording the event and a video will be published afterwards on the Chatham House website. Um, George is going to give us a short presentation uh, about the major findings of his article and then we'll open it up to a QA. and a um, We welcome all of your questions at any time. Um, please put them in the Q&A box below uh, and note that if you don't want to be recognised um, it's possible to submit questions anonymously as well. Um, so yeah without further ado George take us away thank you so much. Okay great thanks Ben. All right, thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to discussing these issues with you all today. So I first got interested in these ways of looking at images in relation to China's development uh, in Africa because I was in interested in how images reproduce ideas about development as common sense, despite them being contested in, at many different levels, conceptually and at the level of implementation. And I'm particularly interested in how images contribute to this reproduction of the ideas of development as common sense and the different ways in which they um, are able to do this. It ties into particular discussions about the politics of development, uh, some of the recent work in international relations on visual politics, and also some of the recent work in China-Africa studies, which is about raising new questions on uh, the politics of knowledge and certain questions about epistemology. So I'll just make a few preliminary points and then I'll dive right. Points that I wanna make is that when we think about development, we often think about it in a particular way. One of the ways we often think about development is that it's as a, process of progressing through particular stages of development. Uh, a lot of you may have heard of Jeffrey Sachs' metaphor of the development ladder. This is a really common and powerful explanation through which we often understand development. And terms like developed and developing and catch up are these shorthand ways of which we generally understand the socioeconomic conditions in particular countries and what their development status is. It's a very powerful way to describe uh, development globally and we often think of these terms in fairly neutral terms and I think this is something that feeds into the way that images have a particular political effect. The second aspect of our development that we often think of in, uh, in terms of it is the role of markets. Economic growth is generally central to development and this is another really important feature of the way we think about development, not necessarily in political terms but almost in commonsensical ways that these are just necessary components of what it takes to modernize and industrialize. So that's the first point. The second point that I want to make is that these ideas are highly contested. Now there's many critiques that I could go into, but for the sake of discussion today, I'll just mention one, and that is that development is often presented as something that is apolitical or it's value free. It's a, a seen as a technical exercise of just applying the right prescriptions. Um, one of the big critiques about development on that particular issue is that development is highly political. If you just consider, for example, uh, on the development ladder metaphor, for example, positioning the West or Western country, Western European countries or North America, for example, as the benchmark of comparison for all other countries to catch up, there is, that is a political move. There are political effects from that way of viewing development and how other countries are expected to catch up. Also, the idea about markets being used as the means through which people are expected to find the basic means of human survival, such as food and water, that is also a political, uh, that also has political implications as well. So I'll come back to the ways in which development is contested, but they're just two, uh, two areas of critique that are important for this discussion. 
Uh, one of the other things that's important that I wanted to mention is in relation to images. They have political effects. This is the way that I'm looking at the way that images work. They do things. This is the kind of issue that I want to get at in terms of how they shape discussion. I think if you think about uh, how images work in the media, for example, they're often there uh, as a, I guess, an, a position of authority, a voice of authority that says the news that's being reported in this particular news article, you know, you know, here is some evidence of it visually to demonstrate that it is actually happening. So this overlap with the way that images are treated as a, an insight into the objective realities of the world is an interesting way that images have particular effects on the way that we think about things. Now, the thing that's interesting about that in relation to development is that we might look at the image of a new stadium or uh, a new building and say, aha, this is progress. Or we might look at an image of a poor rural background and we might say that that is evidence of uh, backwardness or poverty. Now, the two things I wanted to talk about with relation to images is that I focus on the issue of circulation, not just where images are circulated, but how they are circulated. So images can circulate in terms of being a visual metaphor where they are references to broad themes, which can be a useful shorthand way to illustrate the content of a news article, for example, but they can also reproduce stereotypes. And this is when we can start to run into problems. Another issue that's important about images is that the interplay between text and image is important. So the interpretation of images often comes through text. So in relation to China's uh, role in African development, images are a really good way to explore this because a couple of debates uh, in this area have really put on the line questions about uh, about what development is and how we should address particular issues to do with African development. One of the big debates that's been happening in um, relation to China's role in Africa is debates about aid and what is the impact of Chinese approaches to aid. There's a big question here about what the uh, type of aid that has uh, no conditions attached or no strings attached aid will have on African development. And these other questions that keep lingering are whether traditional donors are losing power and influence in Africa. There's also the question here about whether there are new choices for African development. I think when we talk about development as something that involves autonomy and self-determination, I think it's really important to take this question really seriously. And another question that really comes up in a lot of these debates is whether the domestic experience of development in China has lessons for African countries to learn from. This is another really interesting idea that a lot of work has been done on and, and really speaks centrally to this idea of whether it's possible to export those conditions in which poverty reduction was achieved and economic gro growth was achieved at the same time through reforms in agriculture in China post the 1978 reforms. So, what I find is that the uh, coverage in the media and the commentary suggests that development is being discussed differently. We are uh, exposed to a lot of discussions about how China's approach to development is different. But what I have often found is that a lot of the core ideas of development are still there. So I'm interested particularly in how images play a role in representing that. So with regards to some of the examples, one of the first images that I looked at is this image here of the picture of the outline of the African continent filled in with the Chinese flag. Uh, this is a fairly common image uh, that's used as a metaphor, a visual metaphor for China-Africa relations. It features on news sites and online commentary, and it's on the cover of at least four academic books. And I think what's interesting about this particular image is that it conveys a sense of what the identity of the main actors involved in the China-Africa story is, and particularly in terms of portraying an image of the actors as unitary actors. For example, what I mean by that, consider what the impression of China is coming through in this image. The flag, for instance, is that key marker that we associate with sovereign statehood, and it associates Chinese engagement in Africa purely with the goals and interests of the Chinese state. And I think this is interesting. It speaks directly to a bit of an issue that's uh, come up a lot in debates about whether there is a grand strategy being orchestrated by the Chinese government through all activities uh, throughout Africa. Now, there's no doubt that the Chinese state certainly plays a main role and Chinese foreign policy has a big role to play in guiding various aspects of Chinese engagement from aid and economic assistance uh, to the government 
policy you know, that supports Chinese companies. Absolutely, that is the case. But it is easy to blend this idea into ideas that merge with the China threat thesis, for example, and it really reflects anxieties about China's growing global power, I think, particularly for Western audiences. Some of these uh, concerns reflect anx anxieties from the Cold War era, for example, and we can think of images, for example, of the scowling dragon breathing fire over an African continent that's portrayed as vulnerable. These are concerns about Chinese expansionism, I think, that get really projected through this idea of the Chinese flag covering the entire continent. The thing is that a lot of re recent research problematizes these ideas, and in a lot of the work that's done on, for example, the role of Chinese companies in Africa, often the economic motives of Chinese companies are uh, in conflict with the diplomatic goals of Beijing, for example. So it's not that this is a matter of Beijing necessarily orchestrating a grand strategy per se through all activities, um, but it often gets presented like that and speaks to a lot of anxieties in Western uh, audiences. I think an interesting, just quickly, a thought experiment, try reversing the situation. Imagine the outline of the state of China and imagine a flag from Zimbabwe or Kenya or South Africa overlaid of the outline of the Chinese state and think about what that, if that looks strange, what does that say about power in the international system and the power between these two actors, between Africa and China? What is it that seems odd about that? And I think you get an interesting insight into just how much this idea of the Chinese flag covering the continent can play into preconceived ideas about China's values and how they challenge the West. When we talk about Africa in this particular picture, it's also interesting. We have an outline of the African continent here, and I think this really connects well with representations of African agency. The outline can suggest a homogenous space, a space that is always acted upon by outsiders. There's a sense of passiveness that this can convey and a lack of agency, and this ties into a lot of well-known representations of Africa in this respect, it taps into a long history of colonialism, and this has spurred a lot of recent research on the role of African agency um, that shapes the outcomes of Chinese actors. So it's not necessarily the case of a, a passive continent that this image might suggest, but quite in a number of closer studies on how Chinese engagement is unfolding, African, action, African agency actually plays quite a large role here. Uh, there's also a big question here about the diversity between regions. You know, Africa treated as this homogenous space is quite problematic when you think about the differences between sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, the Western coastal regions and the Eastern coastal regions. So there's big questions there about how Africa is represented. There's also questions here about how this image invites us to have a particular view of the international system. I think this is really quite interesting. It reproduces a particular idea of an international system that is primarily state-based. And we can easily uh, run into this view of the state system, of the international system in which states are the main actors. And this is another area where a lot of work on non-state actors in relation to China's role in uh, African development has played a role. This is a really important area to think about. In relation to development specifically, the idea that we are talking purely about states also connects with the idea in modernization theory, for example, and the development ladder that I mentioned before, of states progressing individually through particular stages of development. And I think this idea really gets away from the global situatedness, if you like, the global context in which states actually exist. And a lot of critiques have been done of treating states as independent variables in the international system, such as dependency theory. These critiques have been around for a long time. They talk about how global relations are so important. And this is another way in which it's important to look at recent research that has tried to situate China-Africa relations in a global context. And we've seen some people try and apply dependency theory perspectives to this. So these are really interesting ways to think about how this kind of image generates a lot of these, um, generates a lot of these images. And you can see here through these how they're presented on different news sites. So, the second image that I wanted to look at is a particular photograph. This photograph is of a group of school children in Monrovia, Liberia. These children were photographed uh, while waiting uh, 
for the uh, former um, Chinese President Hu Jintao uh, to be passing through. Uh, this photo is particularly interested. It has been widely circulated uh, on different news sites. I think here's another one from The Guardian here. It's a really interesting photograph, this one, I think. It, and I think it really serves as a visual metaphor for African development. We can see here, of course, China represented through the flag, and Africa represented through the child. And the thing that's interesting about this is it circulates as what I would describe as a decontextualized image. That means that when you read the actual text that accompanies these articles, in some of them, there really isn't much of a reference to the specific conditions in which the photo was taken. Instead, this photo is there to talk about African development more broadly. It's not referring to that particular visit uh, in Liberia. Uh, it's not referring to conditions of uh, development in Liberia. It's really talking generally about how workers are facing uh, job losses due to economic competition or how African governments are handling debt taken on um, from Chinese economic assistance. So in this sense, you know, we're really being treated to a de an image that circulates as a decontextualized image. Now, the first thing that jumps out of these images is the image of the child. And this speaks a lot to how agency can be represented. Ch and children are a, a classic example of how agency can be represented in terms of powerlessness, uh, helplessness, uh, particularly a lack of political power. Think of the way that children are used in scenes of poverty and natural disasters to convey these scenes of help, helplessness. Uh, images of children are also connected to themes of Western humanitarianism. They're also related to generating an ethical impulse in the viewing audience, whether to donate to a charitable organization or uh, act in a way to compel a, a government to act on a particular, or the international community to do something about a particular issue. In relation to uh, the image of the child um, as a representation of African development, these representations can be particularly uh, used to invoke a theme of African life as precarious, vulnerable, and as symbolizing an absence of development. I think what's really important about thinking about how these representations work as a way of describing African development is how they influence particular social theories of change that then stand in as these explanations for the conditions of African development. In this case, African development can become seen simply as something lacking, as, as if the, there is something intrinsic to African societies and something intrinsic, intrinsic to African cultural values that is missing, unlike in the case of the West, where attributes like hard work, entrepreneurialism, democratic values are things that are seen to be under, underpinning industrialization and modernization. And by viewing these things as lacking, we have this particular representation of, Af of African development. The problem with this, I think, is that it obscures colonial legacies and particularly contemporary global structural inequalities, which I think is really important to be pointing out here. Another important metaphor, if you like, that comes out of these images is the parent-child metaphor. The relationship between the parent and the child is a particular dynamic, one where guidance and support and education, you know, these might seem like a natural way in which to view the relationship between Africa and the West. And I think this is really interesting because terms like maturity and immaturity can become used as shorthand terms to describe, for example, the first world as mature and the third world, for example, as immature. And these aren't terms that have really uh, come out of nowhere. These, the term maturity, for example, if you're familiar with uh, Walt Rostow's uh, classic modernization text, the stages of economic growth, Maturity is the stage four level of development where he's specifically referencing a particular point at which industrialization occurs in a national economy that starts to become more sophisticated. And it represents a point in the late 19th century where the US, the UK, uh, Britain, uh, sorry, France and Germany started to really uh, step things up in terms of their economic development. So maturity really has these strong connotations of demonstrating a particular idea about what development is. I think that in relation to China-Africa debates, where these photos become interesting is because they set a, a point of definition before we can even have a discussion about China's role in Africa. These images instantly set 
African development at a particular point. They say that Africa is developing. So before we even have a discussion, we're already engaged in a particular act of definition about what African development is. This also is something that underpins then further calls about what African development should involve. For example, greater integration into the global economy. And I think this obscures the fact that Africa uh, has always been involved, has always been integrated into the global economy as far back as the slave trade, it has clearly been a source of labor and resources. So calling for more integration on the basis of this metaphor of the development ladder can obscure a lot of these um, older historical global social relations. So one other set of photographs that I looked at, or one particular photograph that I looked at here is about representing uh, China, and in a particular way. In this particular photograph, this was uh, of a Chinese worker and two local workers working uh, on a, a drilling rig uh, for a Chinese oil company in Chad. I think this particular image is one that has been behind representations of China as different to the West. Uh, this is a particularly interesting representation because so much of the emphasis on China's role in Africa has very much been inseparable from perceptions about how the West sees its own role in Africa. Now, this image has been widely circulated. Uh, in, this is a picture here. This uh, image is from The Economist. There's another image here where it was uh, published in the New York Times. In this particular image here, it again works similar, similarly to the previous image of the child and it works as a visual metaphor and a decontextualized image in this case, because it's not referring to the specific circumstances in which this photo was taken. Uh, in this particular article, there isn't much of a reference to the conditions of the photo, uh, specifically about Chad and questions of development. It serves rather as a point of differentiation about China's role in Africa. And what we see in a lot of the reporting on China's role in Africa is often an oppositional tone, emphasizing differences between China and the West. We saw that in discussions about how Chinese aid differs from OECD DAC practices. And we also see this in distinctions between, for example, the West having an institutional or social orientated agenda compared to China having an infrastructure centered or economic focused agenda. Another way uh, that, these, uh, that China is differentiated and that speaks to this um, opposition is the representation of China's self-interest and its mercantilism. In contrast to that, the West is often represented as benevolent or humanitarian. And I think the oil company in this picture here really represents China's mercantilism and self-interest quite well. When you read a lot of what the article is about, it's really describing a lot of the ways in which China's political and economic values are quite distinct to the West. And it really puts on the line what's at stake in terms of African governments choosing to go ahead and choose China as a development partner. Again, there's language used in these articles as well that resonate with these dominant ideas of development. For example, referring to uh, the notion of takeoff, which again is a reference to Walt Rostow's modernization theory uh, as a stage of development. These ideas again encourage us to understand that what we are witnessing in this photo is this big question of whether African countries, first of all, defining them as developing, but also asking this question about, will they take off and proceed up the development ladder? Just another photo that is interesting, that's, sorry, the same photo, but another reproduction of this photo that's interesting that raises a different debate. Here, the photo has been cropped and presented on the cover of a UN magazine called Afro Africa Renewal. And this is really interesting where you can see the political effects of an image in a different way. The drilling machinery is cut out, so the focus is even less on Chinese oil companies per se. It's less on discussions about oil and energy. And it's really, talk, it's really narrowing our focus into this impression of uh, cooperation. And this really feeds into this idea of South-South partnership, which is another big debate that's happening at the moment. As you can see, the text gives us uh, these words through which to... Uh, interpret the image in this way, China-Africa partnership, positive sum game. Again, it's raising this question about, you know, are there complementarities between Africa and China that could help them both to climb the development ladder? And I think one of the issues with this again 
is that uh, in focusing on so many differences between China and the West, it overlooks or downplays, if you like, particular similarities between the West. Uh, for example, China also has, uh, you know, a very strong commitment to modernization. If you look at a lot of development uh, programs that are spoken about by Beijing, they very much buy into the idea of a teleological narrative, an idea of stage development through specific stages of growth. I think one of the other things that's interesting about this is that it asks us also, also to buy into a particular way in which the wealthy countries in the international system did manage to industrialize, which was not through integrating in a global system of free trade as much as it was about protecting their industries at a time until they were powerful enough, <clears throat> excuse me, to enforce conditions of free trade on other countries. And just lastly, with regards to questions of China-Africa relations, addressing poverty, inequality and hunger in Africa, you know, it's really important to think about the reproduction of development ideologies and the implications of those. So I'll finish there and maybe some of the issues that I raised we can discuss further in the Q&A. Thanks, Ben. So we have some questions. Um, particip participants, thank you so much for um, sending those in. Keep them coming. We'll, as obviously we've had a bit of a delay, so we'll keep this running for another 20 minutes or so, providing the connection stays strong. Um, so, George, we've got these first questions. I suppose my, I had a, I had a question um, to begin with that kind of drew on the image that you showed us of the African map coloured in with the Chinese flag, um, thinking mm -hmm. about that image in particular. Um, I wondered, does, is that, is that image reflective of how the West sees development today as a thing? Um, mm -hmm. Or is it, more, is it more an indication that they're trying to say that China is doing development in a kind of past inappropriate colonial way? Is it, it does that make sense to the question? Is it, is it kind of reflective of what we do now or is it making a statement about trying to, trying to portray it as a kind of scramble for Africa? Mm. It's, I mean, this comes back to the question of what are the motivations between particular kinds of images? It's always a really hard one to say as to what the truth is behind the way a particular image is designed. Of course. I, this is why I'm, yeah, this is why I'm speaking about the issue of the effects that a particular image has. So in this case, <laughs> it's hard to separate our interpretation of a particular image from our wider social, cultural, historical, and institutional context. Uh, often that particular image, you know, when you look at it, it's funny when you look at it, so uh, I think it's available on Adobe actually, and it just comes with this little one sentence statement that says, this is a visual metaphor for Chinese economic activities in Africa. So, it's almost, it seems to be almost up there with an emoji in terms of something that is a, a common sense kind of way of understanding this particular uh, image. I think I'd have to look a little bit more closely into the origins. I, I couldn't find, I, I have looked into it, but I might need to dig a bit deeper into the very origins. Where, where did it come from uh, specifically and who made it and that sort of thing. Um, but it's an image that I think can get bound up with the convenience of trying to just present a really quick, easy way of understanding here is China's role in Africa. Um, and sometimes that can be the choices of editors that put this image on the cover of academic textbooks, for example. It might not even be the intention of an author who writes a piece uh, for that particular image to be there. Um, so it does also depend on how you read it. I'm sure you could possibly interpret that as an image that says, uh, you know, this is not a bad thing and it's, it's a part of China's growing engagement in Africa um, that does represent new development opportunities and things like that. I think it's just a matter of where the image is, is read. It would be interesting, I think, um, to look at whether this is an image that it circulates a lot in Chinese media. So, you know, is it something that uh, news, article, news uh, sites um, circulating in China use this image a lot to convey their own activities in Africa. What does that say? Would they agree with that? Or not they, I know that's a very essentializing comment, but you know, is this the kind of image uh, 
that the people who are being referred to in it would agree with as a representation of what's going on. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Um, we've got a question here um, from an, an anonymous attendee, but thank you for sending it in anyway, um, which asks um, about the kind of whether you have a sense of the kind of intentionality behind these images. Um, mm. So the question is, to what extent do you think these images are deliberately and consciously being used to convey the themes you're discussing? Um, or instead, does it more reflect the kind of stereotypes that uh, the sort of unconscious biases behind the kind of from the editor's point of view um, who might not be as familiar with the content of the stories where they're just actually so is it, it i guess it's kind of a question about how the media works in terms of who selects the images and why <laughs> yeah absolutely um <laughs> i may i may not provide the most satisfactory answer to this question again to me it seems like something that depends it's, it's a bit of both in some ways, I think, because I think it is the intention of an editor to use an illustration that is a visual metaphor. Uh, you know, in, I'm, I'm not up to speed on the decisions of editors in the news process and how they select images and things, but uh, sometimes a shorthand way to convey images in a particular image is uh, to use something that you might not necessarily think at first glance taps into a whole lot of representations and a whole lot of stereotypes. It might just be simply a way that uh, an editor can use something to visually narrate this typical story that they're trying to uh, tell. And I think that was evident in some of the ways that you look at a particular image and when you actually dig down into where was the image taken, who took it, um, what were the circumstances in which that photo was taken and then you read the article and there's nothing really about the circumstances in which that photo was taken it becomes pretty clear that this is an image that's used as a metaphor and when we get into metaphors that's when we start really sort of running the risk of playing into old stereotypes now on the other hand this isn't to say when we, it's really it's a tricky question because motives i don't want to necessarily say that photographers the professional photographers and the photojournalists that take these photographs, you know, do a lot of amazing work and are in there capturing some really important moments in front of the camera. It's, I wouldn't, you know, I couldn't say for sure whether they wanted to portray that uh, particular type of stereotype either. And, you know, I think what we have here sometimes is a disjuncture between perhaps the intentions of a photographer wanting to catch some, capture something, an event that's happening that might be rare, that might be unseen, that might be unprecedented, and then the uses to which that image is put, and then the subsequent political effects of that image through its circulation and subsequent uses of particular image. So it's, it's a tough one to say, but I think sometimes when you look at the way an image is used in relation to text, it gives you some sort of an idea. Um, yeah, hopefully that sort of provides an answer to, to that question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we've got a question here from Sanju Gurung, who um, is asking about whether you've noticed a kind of shift in recent years in, in the selection of these images and the way that uh, China-Africa relations is being portrayed. So they said, mm -hmm. unlike the picture uh, from 2007 with the African children in Liberia uh, holding the Chinese flags, um, mm -hmm. nowadays it seems that often the flags of both countries are displayed when Chinese delega delegations are visiting Africa and you often see, you know, like, um, the Chinese flags on one side and uh, the specific country's flag that they're visiting on the other. Um, mm -hmm. So he says, Andrew asks, does it mean uh, does this mean, do you think, a shifting of China's approach when projecting its image in Africa? Is it, is it, do you think there's an extent to which it's becoming more about collaboration and kind of equal partnership in terms of the presentation? Um, thank you for that question. I think that's a really interesting question. And I think it is really important to note that some of these photos plug into debates that in some ways things that kicked off earlier debates, you know, Chinese Africa, China Africa relations literature has moved on a lot from discussing ideas about grand strategies in Beijing and, um, and particularly about, you know, now there's a lot of critical literature out there that's talking about how some of the early betrayals 
of China's role in Africa were clearly uh, framed in a way in which they were talking about how the West perceived China as a threat to its interest in Africa. In terms of how some of the images have changed, I found, I thought this was something interesting as well. I picked those images that I did because they were circulated quite widely. I saw them on a lot of sites. If you look at where they get reproduced, it's, you know, there's quite a wide circulation with those. And I, I was wondering, yeah, myself, have, has there been a change in the way a lot of images uh, get circulated? And there still seem to be, to me, these common themes. One of the other things I pick up on in the paper is how infrastructure is another theme of uh, China's role in Africa and its impact on development that often gets used. You'll often see lots of pictures. China might, some representation of China might not even be in the picture, but there's, for example, a railway there or a building uh, or an African worker working on a particular site and, that in, and you find out that that infrastructure project is paid for uh, with Chinese economic assistance. Um, so I think there has been a slight shift in the way a lot of the images get used, but at the same time, there are some ways where some persistent trends continue. Another thing I think that is tied to the Chinese flag is often photos of diplomats are very persistent and it gives us this impression of China and Africa as very much a state elites type relationship. I just think it takes the focus off the role of non-state actors in, in this relationship. Um, and with, in saying that though, I, I would agree that there is greater awareness about how images are being used to portray China's role in Africa. The debate in about agency did a great deal of bringing awareness about how representations matter and make a difference to the conversations that take place after them. So yeah, I, I do think that there has been uh, shifts in some way. Um, as to whether China has been promoting more of a shared cooperative type of approach, I think it's always been trying to present that image, definitely. Um, but the way in which images are used to uh, represent the relationship, I think, has changed the subject for another paper, I think, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions here, thinking about it from um, different perspectives. So I've got a question from Peter Ferdinand, who is asking about whether you have a sense of how um, African states are framing this. Like, obviously, we're, we're seeing this is very much sort of like the Western media's approach to, to um, describing this kind of relationship. Do you have a mm -hmm. sense of whether African states frame Chinese aid differently from Western aid or aid from international organizations is his question. Mm -hmm. um, right, okay, thank you very much. That's a great question as well. Again, this is something that I'm only just starting to look at now. I've been wondering, you know, I did focus on the Western media in this respect. It was a, uh, in terms of the circulation of these images uh, to global audiences and things like that, it seemed like a, a natural way at least to sort of make a start with looking at how images work. In terms of African audiences, I think this is something that uh, I really need to start looking at to get a sense of how it works. I don't think the tropes are necessarily the same. I think those represent, if you look at some of the images that turn up um, on, Afri on South African news sites, I mean, again, of course, it is different depending on where you look. Uh, you know, north, south, you know, there's, there's different conversations happening about China's role. You know, Zambia, for example, you know, depending on countries where you might have anti-Chinese sentiment, of course, I'm referring to the elections along that were a while ago now, but in places where you might have anti-Chinese sentiment or the, uh, the issue of China's role in a particular country is being politicised, then I think absolutely you might find pictures and images that, uh, for example, playing into... Uh, ideas about Chinese workers or Chinese people being isolated from society, you know, playing into particular ideas about there being something maybe nefarious going on uh, in terms of what China's presence is uh, in, in a particular country. Uh, from the other perspective, I think it also works the other way. Um, I, yeah, would have to sort of look at some more images, I, I guess, to give you um, a more definite, I guess, a, a clearer answer on that. But I do think there is some sort of difference there in terms of how images present different representations because it depends on that audience. It depends on that surrounding context in which, uh, the, from which those images are, in which those images are read and what uh, 
you know, the sites at which they're being presented are trying to communicate as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, I've got a question now on uh, whether you've seen ev any evidence of a different trope among all of these images. So Anne Moisen asks, um, are there any images that show African countries leapfrogging over the traditional stages of development, for instance, by skipping mm. the industrial stage entirely and, and moving towards an approach uh, based on new technologies, for example? Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think the when you think about um, the role that uh, Chinese uh, phone companies like Huawei have in terms of their reach across Africa, I think pictures, images that uh, display Chinese phones being used um, in African, in a lot of African countries, in African cities, does a lot to maybe suggest that uh, there is certainly much higher levels of consumption going on. Um, this is something that I think really suggests, you know, perhaps leapfrogging could be something that is happening there. But again, that leapfrogging idea, this is the idea, we're still, I think that still plays into this idea about countries progressing through particular stages of development. I think what's interesting about seeing mobile phones and particular forms of technology being used in African countries in that, in that way, I think it's another symbol of questions about that global context. I think that's what it's an interesting image of, you know, how's technology um, and hardware and software become so much cheaper to distribute. And maybe that's one facet of the China-Africa relationship that reflects things like value chains in the international system and how those have particularly shaped patterns of consumption in Africa. You know, I think it's interesting to also think about whether when we talk about leapfrogging and whether particular forms of technology are contributing to that, you know, I would always keep in the back of my mind, how far is that going towards addressing the substantive issues of poverty and inequality? Um, you might find things like new technologies being used in agriculture, for example. Now, we all know that hunger is, is a really big issue in a lot of African countries. And, you know, we see today technology like using drones to uh, photograph fields and crops and keep an eye uh, on monitoring uh, crop development and things like that. And a lot of the Chinese agricultural demonstration centers use, uh, you know, very uh, modern, you know, up-to-date uh, state-of-the-art technology in this respect. Um, but again, I think it's, it's important to ask those questions about, you know, is it, technology is different, absolutely. The modality of de delivery is certainly different, but to what extent are still a lot of those old structural constraints in which that technology is being delivered remain unchanged? I guess that's what I would ask. Mm. Yeah, really interesting, thank you. Yeah, um, we, I mean, there are many other questions and I, I'm not sure that we're gonna be able to get to all of them today, but I just think there may be two more if that's okay with you, George. Um, sure. So we've got one here from uh, Na Dede, uh, who says, thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned the role of non-state actors um, in this kind of process. What role would you say they play in China's strategy of mutual cooperation with China? <laughs> well, yeah, well, thank you. That's a, a really great question. And I think a lot of research has gone uh, to talking about uh, the role of non-state actors. Uh, uh, obviously, one group, we can talk about Chinese migrants, for example, playing a huge role in terms of um, having an impact on China and uh, African development, in China's role and impact on African development. Um, that is one way I think that it is such an interesting and useful way to get away from a narrative about China-Africa relations that's all about uh, state elites and it's all about political elites and state diplomacy. When we start looking at the migration of people, there's a whole history there that talks about issues of why people might have migrated from China and moved to Africa. We get a whole different insight into what development is and all of a sudden we're not talking about foreign aid or we're not talking about particular Chinese companies, although that's another important non-state actor that is important to mention. You know, we're talking about uh, small scale businesses, for example, we're talking about uh, small groups of people who come over to start up small business, for example, small businesses, for example, I know that Barry Saltman and Yan Hirong have written a lot 
about uh, people setting up small farms, you know, in peripheral areas around um, particular African cities. And this is one way that Certainly there are aspects of development happening in terms of you know, uh, there are people contributing to local economies, there are people moving for reasons that have to do with economic conditions from their country of origin. And these, uh, you know, these flows, uh, cross-cutting flows, have a huge impact on what the subsequent policies of political elites might end up being all about. Um, of course, there's been so much research on African migration to China. Uh, recently, and this is another fantastic way to talk about how do non-state actors impact uh, China's role in African development. You know, and once we start talking about how entrepreneurs from Africa, for example, are also making inroads into uh, Chinese economies over there, I think that's a, a you know another way in which you can get away from that state-centric focus and look at those uh, cross-cutting flows uh, of how development works again. Uh, value chains in the international system is another important issue to talk about when we talk about those relationships of development. This is what I was getting at before when I talk about trying to use a different conceptual lens to understand development, not so much as states progressing up a development ladder per se, but talking about those relationships that shape inequality, you know, and shape particular socioeconomic outcomes in a global context. And migration is one way you could do that. So I could keep talking, but no, that was fantastic. I think migration, and particularly Chinese companies, for example, <laughs> two good examples, definitely. Thank you for the question. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then, just final final question. I'm going to try and, and merge two together so that we so that we uh, fit more in. And um, thank you for that for that discussion of non-state actors. I'm, I'm afraid this question might veer more towards the traditional kind of state. Uh, framing of this question, but maybe not. I, I'd be interested to know your answer. Um, so we've got two questions here, one from Ewan Grant and one from Martin Faller, which is really, um, they're really trying to get at very broadly what the, what the reasons are, um, as you see it, behind China's involvement with Africa and whether these images show that the West really doesn't understand what China is seeking to do in in this mm -hmm. process like what is the sort of yeah does the western development community really understand the geopolitics of of chinese development activity in africa and like if not what are the implications of that i guess and that would be a kind of closing question hopefully <laughs> <laughs> just a massive one to finish <laughs> sorry no, no no thank you for that question as well I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to generalize too much about, there's a lot of differences between development organizations uh, that work in Africa. They may be based in the West, but I think there is a big spectrum of differences between them. Some of them uh, certainly, you could argue, perhaps are a little bit more top down in their prescriptions of development. Others are very much more bottom up, just to use so, you know, a couple of descriptive phrases there. It's, you know, in that way, they, there is an important point of difference between some of them that might be uh, taking local voices more as their point of entry into coming up with development solutions compared to some others that might have a particular blueprint in mind that's a little bit more top down in terms of uh, trying to um, engage with development planning. So I guess from that particular way of understanding that perhaps uh, some of the development organisations that, that are really stuck with that idea that a lot of the Western countries represent that benchmark for comparison for all others is a way in which those representations of other parts of the world needing to catch up is most often the way that I think you're more likely to come across these particular ways in which it's harder for perspectives that are positioned in the West to understand perhaps what some claims to autonomy and claims to social justice look like outside of the West. I think there's completely different political vocabularies in some spaces. Uh, you know, when you, we start talking about um, cosmo, you know, cosmological perspectives, for example, 
uh, about different relationships to, uh, to the land ownership, um, cultural values and things like that can really become things that for people in that particular place are essential to their everyday mode of existence. But perhaps from another perspective, standing outside of that, it's seen as perhaps a barrier to development. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting work that has looked at those particular ways in which different perspectives um, from the West and from Africa, also from China, you know, are all getting, um, are all coming into contact with one another like that. I, it would be amiss of me not to mention the World Bank and dominant financial institutions in all of this. And I think that is where you get a lot of this vocabulary where the language of development incorporates and assimilates a lot of ideas about bottom-up approaches, um, about using people-centered approaches to development. And the language comes across as being quite empowering and seemingly to take on board what I was talking about before in terms of political vocabularies and claims to justice and seeming to take those on board. But there is a way in which by assimilating it into that language, um, <clears throat> excuse me, of the World Bank, it, it still reproduces those dominant ideas of development, that the goal is primarily to catch up, that uh, development is primarily about uh, economic growth. So yeah, it's, it, that's such a huge question. You know, I, I think there's still a fair bit of awareness that um, that could happen on terms of Western counterparts uh, when it comes to understanding what development is. Um, so, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. And, and sorry for throwing that absolutely enormous question at the end there, but um, I thought it was really fascinating. Uh, George. Thank you so much for joining us today and thank you also to our audience for, for joining us for your wonderful questions and for bearing with us during um, the technical hitch. I, I'm going to describe it as an intermission. It was always planned. Um, just wanted to give you guys a chance to read George's excellent blog post before the Q&A began. Um, George's uh, full article can be found on the International Affairs website now. It's titled uh, How Images Frame China's Role in African Development. Um, and Yes, thank you for joining us. We'll be back soon um, with more of these uh, International Affairs webinar events and have a nice day. George, have a nice evening. Thanks very much, Ben. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone.